Welcome everybody to our panel this afternoon. Uh, I'm Father Justin Brophy, and I, uh, I welcome you to more than a mask, personhood in Greek literature. If you give me a couple of minutes, I'm just gonna introduce our, our three speakers today. Uh, first, we have Jordan Dorney. Jordan is a fellow of history at New St. Andrews College, a small liberal arts college in the reforms tradition with a mission to graduate leaders who shape culture, living faithfully under the lordship of Jesus Christ. He is assistant director of the Classical Christian Studies Master's Program, and he holds a PhD in political science from the University of Notre Dame. He lives in northern Idaho with his wife and three children. Abe Scherner holds a PhD in ancient Greek philosophy from the University of Toronto and taught at St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland for 10 years. He left in 1998 to make wine in Napa. <laughs> Since then, he has founded the Scolium Project, a Northern California winery and the Los Angeles River Wine Company a winery dedicated to making wine from the pre-prohibition vineyards of Southern California. And finally, uh, Dr. Benjamin Yates. And Ben Yates reads classics at the University of Chicago. He holds his MA from the same institution and before that graduated summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Dallas with degrees in Greek and Latin. His research at Chicago presently focuses on Greek literature and tragedy, and he's also interested in the theory and praxis of ancient language teaching and contemporary debates about the classics. Outside the classics, he reads 20th century theology for fun. And he's a parishioner at St. Mary's Byzantine Catholic Church in Whiting, Indiana. So welcome to our panelists. This is uh, Herodotus on the Marks of Personhood. The history, or the histories, depending on how you want to take it, of Herodotus is a personal rather than an impersonal history, and that seems like a good place to begin. Herodotus is always present over the course of the nine books on his two and only two subjects, and if you've read the book, you might think maybe there's more, but if, uh, if you read the proem, he says first, uh, there are the other things, and second, the cause of the war between the Hellenes and the barbarians. Uh, this is the Persian War or wars that span the first half of the 5th century BC. Herodotus recedes uh, and resurfaces at various moments, but he is always there. After all, the whole book, he says, is the demonstration or display of his investigation or his judgment, the apodexis of his historia. And this history is therefore Herodotus's and no one else's. However, often he speaks of the stories that are told by this or that people or this or that poet or historian. The first character then is Herodotus himself. The first face that we see, the first apparition, the first individual, the first person, grammatical or otherwise, is Herodotus of Halicarnassus. Now, for now, I'm going to stipulate to my ignorance about the biographical tradition surrounding Herodotus, although there may be some interesting things in there. Uh, Aristotle, for instance, calls him Calabrian from Thurii, and I know this is uh, controversial to say here, but Aristotle is usually correct. I would certainly, though, set aside Plutarch's attack on Herodotus's malice or his evil ethic, kakoetheia, or the idea that he was paid off by certain parties to slander those very virtuous Corinthians or Boeotians. What I'd like to do instead, then, is examine character, face, apparition, individual, in other words, personhood in Herodotus. There are a few words and concepts that plausibly or implausibly translate to the person, and I'm going to advance an argument about them. Herodotus shows first that personhood is bound up in judgments about the way things appear to be and the way they really are. And second, that what is lacking in nature but is supposed to be supplied by scientific knowledge is a reliable means of making those judgments. And if this seems like a general description of Herodotus's historical method, that's because the framework of the person is, in fact, a very useful thing for elaborating that method. I'll leave aside grand arguments precisely defining the unity of his logoi or his logos uh, to other folks. Uh, the history, I suppose, is unified like a face is unified, uh, or like the virtues, and you can read your Plato to figure out why that's a problem. 
It would be entirely reasonable uh, to take humanity and humanness uh, to be the subject of at least some of the histories, some of the Logoi. What are the boundaries of human existence? Are the barbarians only savages or savage animals? History as geography at least wonders whether weird places produce weird people. Uh, to adapt Cyrus's famous saying from the closing passage uh, of the histories. Yet the world and its image, the map, uh, are not so neat. Only tyrants and the ignorant, uh, which we find out in Herodotus are the same, uh, do not discover that it is irrational, in fact, to assume the precise rationality so-called of the connection between the earth and the people. There are weirdos, it turns out, at home and abroad. People change their names, their languages, their lands. Humans are everywhere, even if some of them eat other humans, uh, and even if some of them bury or burn them instead. It's personhood then, I think, rather than humanity that really is in dispute in the history. How do we identify persons? Well, with some good justification, Euripides' Medea laments that Zeus has given, quote, no natural character to men's bodies to mark them as good or bad that the moral quality, in other words, of their person has no physical sign. I suppose, uh, among other things, that a racial or an ethnic reading of that play might make this line interesting in some other ways, and uh, there's certainly things uh, in Herodotus uh, that would be relevant for that. But the focus in both texts, I think, uh, is not entirely devoted in the first place to the problem of, way, of the way people look, uh, at least in that sense. The problem of what kind of person I am uh, and the kind of person I'm seeing has to do with something else. When you, when you look at Jason or when Medea does, uh, she can't tell that he is the sort of person who will screw around. Herodotus, I think, indicates that the problem lies in the fact that such a character, whether it's in the face or in the tongue or in the physical or political body, might be present by nature, that character might be present by nature, but the power to discern that character may not be present in us by nature. So character, and that's character, uh, and not prosopon, the mask or the character and tragedy, character and not ethos or athos. Uh, character is the impression that one has and the impression that one gives to other things. Character is the peculiar stamp uh, of, or sign of a thing that's visible at a glance and visible when it's imprinted on something else. It's what's immediately noticeable, in other words, if not immediately understandable. Thus, in Herodotus, the pre-Hellenic peoples of Attica have a certain, quote, character of the tongue, a certain dialect of language, a certain cast of speech, the Ionians, too, have their character or their characteristic speech. In both cases, they're distinguished either from the Greek or the barbarian languages, respectively, uh, as well as distinguished from other iterations of either of these. So whether anyone can tell, whether you, you need a linguistic expert to properly distinguish all of these things, the personal character of these so-called dialects is present and visible, and yet not easy to describe without some knowledge, historical or otherwise, that is hard to come by. And perhaps this is the knowledge that Herodotus himself possesses and is teaching, at least in part. So to this sort of auditory or audible personhood, uh, we might annex another. The character of the face of Cyrus uh, is apparent to his grandfather, uh, as the character of his speech is almost simultaneously revealed. If you know this uh, story, Cyrus had, uh, Cyrus's grandfather, Astyages, had tried to have him killed as an infant, didn't work out. Uh, I'll also have to leave aside what is probably the most important Herodotian text for the relationship between eye and ear witness uh, to the truth uh, and the apparent superiority of, of uh, ear witness, and that's the Lydian story of Gyges and Candales and their mutual wife. Uh, Cyrus, uh, to go back to that story, Cyrus has been raised by peasants, but he is immediately known to be royal by his words and works and most importantly by his face. This is more than the family resemblance that the murderous, or at least would-be murderous, Astyages sees in his grandson. Cyrus is not genetically, but generally, not just by mere birth, but by fundamental nature, the kind of guy who, uh, is, who looks like a king. His person is kingly. Contra Medea, it would seem, uh, this is clear simply by looking at the man. Uh, but there's more than this. Astyages, and not his vassals, or his vassals' uh, sons who have been playing with Cyrus, are, are, Astyages, rather than them, are the, is the one who recognizes Cyrus completely. It takes a king, or at least someone who knows kings intimately, to discern this thing that is nevertheless present in the face alone. In other words, knowledge is still required. What's present by nature, uh, to uh, go to a different set of passages, what's present by nature is hidden, uh, or is to be hidden from the natural world. Thus we find at least three stories of human beings who cover their faces. 
and the very particular conditions of, the, of those coverings uh, in Herodotus's narrative of the barbarian ethnoi, the barbarian nations. So the Egyptians plaster the face of their dead, uh, but you probably don't need me to teach you about mummies. Uh, but what's more important, the living Egyptians, the women of the household uh, of the dead, uh, which Herodotus tells us are like men everywhere else, they reverse some of the normal customs related to gender, those women also cover their faces, plastering them with mud. The Arabians, when they go searching for cassia, oh, you can read Psalm 45 about that, uh, they cover their faces with leather strips, uh, but they leave their eyes uh, exposed to see through. And the Scythians uh, apply a thick paste of cannabis, uh, to their faces, uh, and one can see in these things just three cultural practices, but I think there's more going on there, there's more at stake. Uh, but you, I'll have to leave them aside for, for the moment. Uh, the final and even more cryptic example from nature is that of the ibis. There are two kinds of ibis, it turns out, Herodotus tells us, even though some people think there's just one. My, my uh, students told me I should just call this talk, there are two kinds of ibis, and try to bamboozle you for 15 minutes talking about these two things, but there you go. Uh, in other words, there's much more uh, going on here. Uh, but these two ibises uh, evidently differ in the presence or absence of feathers on the head. There, that is, uh, in terms of uh, baldness or hairiness, and the, the personal example uh, soon will be reversed there. Uh, they differ in the coloration on the feathers uh, on their neck and on the wingtips, in other words, the parts that are exposed by clothing, neck, and wingtips, uh, but their legs and their faces resemble one another, and thus you can't tell the difference. Uh, now translators and normal people will talk about the birds' uh, beaks, but Herodotus discusses their hooked faces. Those that live closer, we, or at least the Egyptians or the Arabians, recognize more easily, but it's those that live far away that are actually our friends. After all, they're the ones that defend us from those winged serpents that Herodotus saw massive piles uh, of their bones. In other words, uh, precisely because the, the faces of these two sorts of birds are the same, we can't tell the difference even when one is our friend uh, and one is at, uh, at least lukewarm to us. Now, uh, the face then is somehow important to determining not just uh, abstract concepts of personhood, but real personhood. Your face is who you are. Two of the most well-known uh, stories from the history depend on the problem of discerning persons. There's the story of the false Smyrtus, uh, who's uh, really a Smyrtus, but just isn't the one that you're thinking of. Uh, there's also the story of Gyges, which I've mentioned before. But here again, Herodotus presents more the problem than the solution. Knowing the name is not enough, just as seeing the face is not enough. So again, Smyrtus has the right name, but the wrong face, or rather the wrong ears. Uh, they've been chopped off. Uh, he can't be discovered because he's playing the part. He's in character as the king of Persia. No one is allowed to come and see his face. He can only be discovered in the dark when the daughter of Otanus and member of the royal harem confirms his character. Smyrtus is the Magian usurper who, with an ugly and deformed face, uh, uh, has been punished uh, or had been punished on Cyrus's orders. Smyrtus is not the son of Cyrus, whose face was obviously regal. Uh, even when it was dressed in the peasant clothes of his foster parents. So Smyrtus looks like what he is, but the problem is no one can see what he looks like. Uh, Otanus' suspicions and Darius's, which come out uh, as well, are reasonable, but they can't be tested. There's no way of discovering who this person is that's on the throne of Persia. Uh, the epistemological problem of personhood uh, is not only philosophical, but political, or it's a problem of political philosophy. A name is not enough to establish personhood as perhaps evidenced by the mystery of the one or the two, or maybe uh, some folks identify seven different Otanuses uh, in, in Herodotus's narrative, uh, and good luck to you trying to uh, extricate all those things. Uh, but again, one might make an appeal to the power of law, to civic personhood, civic identity, uh, as one way of, of overcoming the naturally fraught character of personal identity. But even this, uh, one has some uh, initial doubts about. After all, what does a Spartan look like? What does a Persian look like? Well, you're probably thinking of something. Uh, but it's almost an act of insanity to deny uh, this element of personhood. And thus we have the story of Cleomenes, the king of Sparta. Cleomenes, uh, who uh, is, when he's at the height of his madness, which uh, Herodotus reminds us was not all that far from how deranged he was uh, his whole life. But at the height of his madness, he goes around the city, striking the Spartiates, the full Spartan citizens, in the face with the royal scepter. The story of Cleomenes' death, uh, 
a dramatic one, like all things in Herodotus, involves not so much tricking uh, as overawing his helot prison guard and demonstrates that he has not, in fact, lost all his rationality. Uh, he, he means something by attacking the faces of the Spartiates. Uh, he is uh, trying to injure their person. The distinction, though, uh, should be one that's already visible. Uh, in fact, a crazy Cleomenes uh, can see the distinction. The distinction between a Messenian and a Spartan, a helot and a, a citizen ought to be visible but they've been lost or occluded uh, or somehow uh, confused. So Cleomenes is self-destructive and mutilates his own flesh, uh, but he only needs to insult the faces of others. Uh, this Cleomenes strikes these men with his royal authority, thus declaring them non-persons. Well, uh, maybe the gods can save us if the city can't. Uh, and I said that Herodotus was the first apparition here. Uh, there are others. Um, uh, the substance of which you can, uh, I can uh, point to a few of them, but uh, the idea is that uh, these apparitions, which are accompanied sometimes by divine signs, are connected to persons. Uh, it's not just enough that something dramatic happens, like it rains in Thebes, uh, or uh, a thunderbolt strikes the house of a certain person. Uh, it depends on a certain personal view of the gods uh, that Herodotus is, ex is extrapolating here. So uh, the apparition of these fantastical persons is tied to the apparition of divine signs. Passing, though, briefly over that uh, to head towards my dramatic conclusion here. Uh, we can invoke an, one more uh, term, one more concept that I think is related to the person, and that is the character, the idiot, the idiotes, the, the private man. Uh, now, here we have the mere person, the person as opposed to the official, especially the king, the person as the ordinary person, and I think this adds to uh, our Herodotian exposition of personhood. The idiots, the mere person, says Croesus, uh, are obviously less happy than Croesus. Uh, in death, the Scythian kings are elaborately, elaborately buried, but mere persons uh, get a modest celebration, ultimately resulting in that cannabis ritual that I referred to before. The idiot is second rate. Uh, he is emphatically only a person, though still with some responsibilities that intrude upon that personhood, so that, for instance, in Sparta, the kings, even if they're not at the common meal, uh, are owed uh, the same uh, privileges with respect to food if they're dining in the homes of idiots. So the idiot as, uh, as a person, in contrast to the man in office, is not the distinction between the human being and the person, but perhaps too Hobbes-like, uh, between the natural and the artificial person, a very productive, if for obvious reasons, potentially very dangerous distinction. Uh, so we have a, a few uh, sort of rotten examples uh, of the idiot uh, here in Herodotus. It was while an idiot at the Olympic Games that Hippocrates, father of Pisistratus, the tyrant, uh, received a sign of his son's coming tyranny. The Samians say that Samian idiots, not the polis, obviously, not its officials, but just private persons, mere persons, had bought and definitely not stolen uh, a certain bull from the Spartan delegation that was intended uh, to go to Croesus. No idiot, uh, says Harpagus, uh, would be able to punish Astyages, uh, a nice guy, tried to kill his grandson, fed somebody's son uh, to him, all these, all these things. Uh, uh, and so therefore Harpagus has to con consort and even court uh, Cyrus, uh, who is emphatically not a mere person. None of these stories of idiots in Herodotus, in other words, are neutral in making that distinction. So Demaratus, who's the enemy of Cleomenes, when he arrives in Persia, he tells Darius uh, to prefer the son that was born while Darius was king and not the one who was uh, born first by nature while Darius was still, quote unquote, an idiot. Now, this is not, I would suggest, the contrast between the natural and political fatherhood uh, in Darius, but between the natural and artificial person of Darius. The person, the idiot, uh, is not quite without office. His idiocy, his mere personhood, is a kind of office as well. So, uh, is the solution to this problem of discerning persons as a scientific or political problem, is it the withdrawal from political uh, public life? Evidently, this retreat into idiocy uh, still is no sure bulwark against the matter, although it has its charms. Amasis, the king of Egypt, uh, not, a, not a little unlike Herodotus himself, is a leveler uh, and a violator of oracles. And one is reminded also of Cambyses and Herodotus on that account. But um, Amasis turns out to still be an idiot uh, even when he becomes king. He is Philopotes, lo he loves to drink. He is Philoscomon, he loves to joke. But uh, he is emphatically not philosophic, uh, despite his pseudo-philosophic wisdom that he delivers. 
He's a mirror image then to Cyrus, who was a king even while an idiot. This Amasis is an idiot even while he's a king. But what then is Herodotus's position? Well, in the end, I think uh, this is only a preliminary and uh, very quick uh, and elusive uh, look at how Herodotus might contribute to our understanding of the person. Whatever, uh, whatever else it might be, the history or histories is personal not merely because of the presence, but because of the problem of the presence of Herodotus throughout. Thanks. It's such an intense honor and a pleasure to be here that I almost can't say. And it is a tremendous credit to Carter Sneed and his team that they have put together a panel that fits together so well. I'm really glad to be part of this panel. I'm going to pay a lot of attention to Homer's language about body and soul. I'm going to concentrate on the Iliad with a brief excursus into the Odyssey. The talk will be in four parts. The last part consists of some reflections on the metaphysical difference between farming grapevines and rows with a trellis and growing them more helter-skelter as freestanding bushes. <clears throat> Section one, the philology of the body. The Iliad, as is well known, begins with a statement of the poem's theme, the anger of Achilles. The anger is immediately characterized in the following way. The anger that heaped numberless pains on the Achaeans and sent many strong souls of heroes to Hades before their time. The Iliad is somehow so familiar, even if we have not read it recently, that it can be hard to pay attention to its exact language. What does it mean to send the soul of a hero to Hades before its time? What would it mean for it to be on time? I don't think that this is easy to answer. The next line in the poem is even stranger. The fate of souls of the heroes is contrasted with what? Well, we expect the fate of their bodies. We expect the standard contrast or opposition between souls and bodies. In fact, Homer says that the anger sent many strong souls to Hades before their time and made them pray for all the dogs and birds. Them, not their bodies. It is so easy to miss this because our mind leaps ahead and supplies the contrast that we expect. What does it mean that Homer uses the word for them or themselves here and not one of the words for body? Instead of answering this immediately, I'd like to engage in a little philology and look at the various words and the way that he uses them. I'm going to do this in a somewhat chatty way, not as rigorously as one could do it, but in a manner that seems appropriate to this time and place. What is the Greek word for body? It might be soma, the, word, the root of our word somatic, for instance. This word is common in later Greek, but somewhat uncommon in Homer. He uses it only 10 times in the Iliad and the Odyssey, most of the time for animals, not for human beings. One of the most prominent uses is toward the end of the Iliad, when Achilles is about to slay Hector, and, we suppose, sent his soul into Hades before its time. Hector implores, implores Achilles in the following way, not to leave him by the ships to be devoured by dogs, but to return his body, his soma, to his mother and father, and to send it home. The body that Hector is talking about here is a dead body, a corpse. In all of its 10 uses in Homer, soma always and only refers to a dead body, to a corpse. Is there no word for living body? The closest word that I can find is the word kros, the word for skin, in the sense of the surface of a living thing. It's outside. I've looked pretty hard, and I can find no word that Homer uses to point to the living body of a human being. While we expect the opposition in body and soul to be applicable to the heroes while they are alive, it seems possible that this opposition only becomes conceivable for Homer in death. While they are alive, the heroes are indivisible wholes, Hector, Patroclus, Achilles. They have a skin that can become pale or cold and that can then be wrapped in a cloak, 
but they only have a body once the soul is sent to Hades. Let's spend a moment on the word for soul, psyche. It would be somewhat odd, or at least asymmetrical to us, if Homer used psyche for living things, but had no word opposing it for the living body. You might, in fact, expect me to insist that this psyche becomes evident only after death. I'm not going to answer this categorically now, but I want to examine two crucial uses of the word in the Iliad. The first is a passage so long and beautiful that I want to quote a real translator. I've chosen Robert Fagels. The scene concerns the Greek Diomedes battling the Trojans Aeneas and Pandarus in book five. Diomedes is about to slay Pandarus. He hurled his javelin and Athena drove the shaft and it split the archer's nose between Pandarus' eyes. It cracked his glistening teeth. The tough bronze cut off his tongue at the roots, smashed his jaw, and the point came ripping out beneath his, skin, beneath his chin. He pitched from his car, armor clanged against him, a glimmering blaze of metal dazzling around his back. The purebreds reared aside, hoofs pawing in the air, and his life and power slipped away on the wind. The word that Fagels translates, the words that Fagels translates as life and power are psyche and menos. Menos means something like the physical strength, the power that is in the limbs. It's hard to know exactly what psyche means here. Whatever it is, it is loosed, released, luthe, at the moment of death, suggesting that it is present in the living thing before death and is released in this case by the terrible effects of Diomedes' javelin on Pandarus' nose, his teeth, his tongue, his jaw. These physical details make clear that what we might call the parts of the body are evident to Homer and to his audience, even if the status of the body itself is problematic. It's not the case that the parts of the body are somehow invisible. This shows that it is not the physical form that goes unsaid in the Iliad. What is absent is a concept of a whole body separate from the soul. Until the moment of death, there is the living whole, the person that goes by a name, Achilles, Hector, Patroclus, and not two distinct elements. There is not what we might call an embodied soul or an ensouled body. If the body and soul are not two distinct entities that somehow form a living whole, what then is the status in life before it is released of the soul? In the midst of this rapid and cursory survey, I want to steer us to one more crucial use of psyche in the poem. It only increases, not relieves, the problematic. Section three, there is some kind of soul. The anger of Achilles separates him from the rest of the Greeks before it eventually sends the souls of the many heroes to Hades. During this period of separation, Achilles stays apart from the fray and slayed no one. And during this period of his inactivity, the Trojans massacred the Greeks, and after 10 years of even battle, threatened to destroy them all, or at best to send them home. The situation was reversed when Achilles' closest friend, his beloved Patroclus, took the field and was killed by Hector. This in turn caused Achilles to return to the battle, to, stay, to save Patroclus' corpse from desecration and to wreak vengeance upon Hector. He did so, slayed Hector, and so eventually brought two corpses back to the Greek camp, Patroclus's to bury and Hector's to desecrate himself, acting alone among the Greeks. Achilles fell asleep that night, exhausted, before he could begin the lengthy and intricate funeral rites for Patroclus. Patroclus visits the exhausted Achilles in his sleep. I'm going to quote Fagels again at some length. The ghost of the stricken Patroclus drifted up, he was like the man to the life, every feature, the same tall build, the same fine eyes and voice, and the very robes that used to close his body. Hovering at his head, the, sorry, hovering at the head of Achilles, the phantom rose and spoke. Sleeping Achilles, you've forgotten me, my friend. You never neglected me in life, and now in death. Bury me, quickly, let me pass the gates of Hades. They hold me off at a distance, all the souls, the shades of the burned out, breathless dead. They never let me cross the river, mingle with them. They leave me to wander up and down, abandoned, lost at the house of death. 
with the all-embracing all gates. And the swift runner Achilles reassured him warmly, why have you returned me here, dear brother, dear friend? Why tell me all of that that I must do? I will do it all. I will obey you, your demands. Oh, come closer. Throw our arms around each other just for a moment. Take some joy in the tears that numb the heart. In the same breath, he stretched his loving arms but could not seize him. No, the ghost slipped underground like a wisp of smoke with a high, thin cry. And Achilles sprang up with a start and staring wide, drove his fists together and cried in desolation, ah God, so even in death's strong house, there is something left, a ghost, a phantom, true, but no real breath of life. All night long, the ghost of stricken Patroclus hovered over me, grieving, sharing warm tears, telling me point by point what I must do. Marvelous, this ghost liked to the man in every way. The word that Fagels translates as ghost at the beginning of the passage is psyche, when Homer, the narrator, is speaking. This is the same word that Achilles uses later to exclaim after he tries to hug Patroclus, but cannot. What is it that Achilles discovers here? Even exhausted and sleepy, he knows that the Patroclus who hovered over him, with whom he shared warm tears, is dead. He knows that he has spent the night with a shade. What he discovers is not that there are shades in Hades, but that he cannot embrace this visiting shade, this psyche. In other words, he does not discover something like that there is an immortal or post-mortal soul. What he discovers is that this soul is insubstantial, that it has no frenes. The lexicons say that frenes means something like midriff, though it's hard to give this word a modern meaning outside of contemporary habits of dress. You could say that it means the central part of the torso, that it contains the heart and lungs and diaphragm. It for sure means something that you can hug. In a somewhat different me metaphorical or idiomatic register, you might translate the plural noun frenes as guts. What does it, <clears throat> why does it surprise Achilles that the shade has no guts? Precisely because the shade, the suke, looks wondrously and exactly like him, like the living Patroclus. If only the ghost had looked less like the living Patroclus, Achilles would not have been surprised. What Achilles learns here is not that the psyche is an immortal animating force of the body, but that the psyche is merely the wondrous Eidolon, the image of the living body, of the whole, of the person. There are no guts in Hades nor are there among the dead on the battlefield. Achilles sends the likenesses, the images of heroes down to Hades and leaves the gutted originals behind to become prey for birds and dogs. Section four, bodies and souls in the underworld of the Odyssey. It's nearly impossible, having come so far with bodies and souls in the Iliad, not to look at the tremendous tour de force that is Odysseus's visit to Hades in the Odyssey. He's told to go there by Circe, so that the dead seer Tiresias can tell him what he, Odysseus, needs to know in order to get home. Once he reached Hades, he finds, in a way that we would expect from Achilles' lesson about Shukai and images, that he can immediately see and recognize all the souls thronging about him. He sees his mother, dead companions, even recognizes kings from prior ages, recognizing personages that Odysseus himself has never met. You might say that this recognition is possible because of their iconography. Odysseus sacrifices a ram and a ewe in front of them, and the souls crowd around, each trying to drink some of the sacrificial blood. Achilles must, uh, I say Achilles, Odysseus must prevent them with his sword. Evidently, they cannot speak unless they drink the blood and most of them seem to want to speak to Odysseus. The Sukai have their looks intact and their memories and even perhaps their personalities, but to regain their voices, they need something physical, substantial, that flows from bleeding animals. The first soul that Odysseus speaks with is his former companion, Elpinor, who died only days ago, having fallen drunk from a roof after a feast. Elpinor wants only one thing, 
for Odysseus to return to his prior mooring and inter Elpenor's body left behind in haste. He wants Odysseus to burn his body and heap a barrow above it and plant an oar into the barrow so that men to come will learn his story. The most interesting thing in Elpenor's language is the following. In asking Odysseus to bury him, he says, do not leave me behind unwept and unburied, but burn me in my honor, in my armor. Elpenor is clear and emphatic. He does not say, don't leave behind my body. Don't fail to burn my body. He says, me, burn me. Even he, the shade speaking to Odysseus, even he knows that, he's both, that he is but an Eidolon, an image of himself. Section five, some considerations of grapevine training. There's an interesting scholarly dispute in Homeric studies. Did the armies fight in ranks in a formation equivalent or similar to the later hoplite phalanx? Or is the battle somehow more freeform? There are really interesting sociological and economical considerations that flow from how one answers this question. Considerations about the structure of society in the times that the poems were composed, about the roles of citizen soldiers as opposed to aristocratic heroes. The citizen soldiers would have fought in phalanxes where the individuals would disappear, nameless, sublated into the hole, fighting for the city. The aristocratic hero contending against another king or prince in solo battle would be fighting primarily for his own glory with the safety of his peers or the victory of the whole army, not necessarily subordinated to his glory, but wholly dependent on it. It turns out that there is an absolutely analogous distinction to be made in the growing of wine grapes. There is a school of thought that arranges the vines in long rows with equal spacing between the individual plants within each row and then also between the rows themselves. On hillsides, carefully constructed contours and terraces maintain the equality of spacing. On the flatlands, the work is easy. Say five feet between each vine and its neighbor and eight feet between the rows. The resulting hole is kind of like a Cartesian grid with two perpendicular axes and a single vine corresponding to each point on the grid. All of the points are equivalent to each other. None is privileged. The foliage of the vines thus arranged is compressed by wires into a flat panel that runs continuously down the length of the row. It is barely three dimensional, only a few inches wide, and it is managed carefully with pruning and hedging so that it does not intrude into the row. When managed successfully, the leaves of each vine abut the leaves of each neighbor without a break. The foliage trained in this way is often referred to as a palisade. Uniformity, predictability, and control are the aims of this kind of farming. You may have seen in person or in photographs these kinds of vines, long flowing rows of green with thin brown trunks at equal distances supporting the palisades of leaves, connecting them to the ground. No one takes photos of these vines in winter when all you would see would be their skeletons with the thin branches that held the leaves waving empty in the air. The palisade is the object of fascination and delight. It turns out that there's also another way of establishing and training a vineyard, more ancient, more common in the old vineyards in the southern Mediterranean and on Mediterranean islands. Here, the vines are still planted at regular intervals, in most cases on a grid. But the vines are not trained in a way, in such a way that they flow into each other. There is no palisade, no phalanx. The vines stand alone in little bushes or sometimes when old and strong and stout, gnarled trees, no higher than a human chest. Each vine grows into its own shape, even under the effects of human pruning. No two vines look alike or produce exactly the same fruit. The excellence of the vineyard is never measured by its uniformity or its predictability. We work with several such vineyards. The oldest one planted in 1896, the youngest in 1918. We can recognize individual vines within the vineyard, and to some of them we have even given names. The vines are engaged in a constant struggle to survive. It is wonderful to be witness to their battle. 
we celebrate their triumph every year at harvest. I did not realize until I sat down to write this paper how Homeric are the vineyards we work with. Thank you so much. I have very good news. I finally have a clicker. <laughs> I've arrived. <laughs> My dream has come true. So I'm talking today about the Antigone, Sophocles Antigone. Dead people in Sophocles Antigone. I'm also doing something else. I'm gonna be talking about a Catholic thinker and a Catholic architect. I think these two things are maybe a little bit strange, yeah, in a, in a conference about the human person. Talk about dead people and an architect. So I'm gonna offer a quick defense of both things. So first, about dead people. You may wonder, well, here we are, talking about the human person, how the human person is constituted. Considering how a corpse, a dead person, is treated is the focus of the Antigone. Can we really say, then, that an understanding of what makes a living person a person, or how characters in this play understand a living person to be constituted, can be extracted from how a dead person is treated? I think we can. A dead person, I suggest to you today, is an image of a living person. To argue about how the dead should be treated is not to argue about how the living should be treated. But an understanding of the living can be reached through an understanding of the dead. And to help me here, I quote an English professor from my undergraduate days, Brent Bourbon. The dead, he says, are what they are relative to their history. We do not grasp them simply relative to what they now are. What they now are, inanimate material, is yet still a body, a human body, similar to our own. It has a crucial difference, though. It is totally passive. When I die, I can't fight back. My ghost, maybe. My corpse, no. I am totally subject to the treatment of others. To connect Bourbon's insight then to this one is to say that a corpse presents us with what a dead person is relative to their history, a person, as well as what they are now, a lump of earth. A lump of earth that is yet an image of our own and sold lump, of our own and sold bodies. So next for, for Paul Virilio. Who is Paul Virilio? Who's this theorist? He's an interesting kind of theorist. Most of his works, written around the 70s, 80s, and 90s, come to us in the form of polemical tracts and interviews. He was a friend of Foucault's, was friendly with Parisian performance artists, artists and unfortunately pornographers, but then pulled a fast one and converted to Catholicism. He was interested in the effects that technology have upon us and how these technologies affect our bodies. Virilia was fond of saying in his interviews that a man on a desert island may cry out, SOS, save our souls. But we really in this present postmodern moment should rather say, save our bodies, the acronym for which uh, would not work in English, <laughs> unfortunately. Save the incarnate nature of man from that which encroaches upon him. For Virilio, this was cyber sexuality, telepresence, a kind of science that sees of our flesh nothing but material for the machine. So Virilio was a theorist. He wasn't just a theorist, though. He just didn't want to write uh, polemical tracts. He also wanted to put his ideas in a building. He wanted to put his sermons in stone. So he wanted slanted floors. Yes, slanted floors. Huh? What in the world does this have to do with the incarnation? You may reasonably ask. Here we have two sketches that he himself did. Well, when we think about slanted floors, they make, the, they make you always aware of your body. It requires effort, great effort, to traverse an oblique plane. Every movement requires an adaptation of your body. There is resistance to the body with these floors, Virilio says. And resistance makes us aware of the body's existence. Virilio calls this idea of resistance, this reminder of our incarnate nature, the oblique function. The oblique forces us back into ourselves by resistance. It discloses to us our bodies again. Virilio goes on further to speak of the three separate bodies we can think of that we have. 
our animal body or our body proper, our social body, and our territorial body or the world. Virilio explains the relationship of each one of these bodies to one another. They are grafted onto each other. The animal body is the body we share with, well, animals, in a sense. It is the body that Adam recognizes he shares with the rest of the garden as a body among bodies, as Wojtyla says. This is the body that sweats. This is the body that Rosencrantz, in Tom Stoppard's play, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, says, quote, another curious scientific phenomenon about our bodies is the fact that the fingernails grow after death, as does the beard, close quote. This is our own proper material presence. The social body is the body we share in communion with others in relationships with others in the city. Then we have the territorial body, which for the sake of time, I'm going to omit. We suggest, I suggest that we see these two bodies, the animal body and the social body attention in the Antigone. At the opening of Sophocles Antigone, Oedipus's daughter Antigone suggests that Polynices, her brother, has no body but an animal body. The animal body and its total deadness and its total fleshiness is her brother for her. The animal body is dear to her in a weird way in which it doesn't seem to be for others. We first see this when she describes Polynices as a sweet treasure house, a glucun thesaurum, for birds to look at as they look out for food. She's reporting the decree that Creon has made, that Polynices is not to be buried to her sister Ismene. She says that Creon has decreed that he is to be left unwept, unburied, a sweet treasure house for the birds to look at for the sake of food. A sweet treasure house. Antigone provides to the birds her own viewpoint of the corpse. It has a sweetness for her. When after this, Ismene, her sister, has heard Antigone's whole idea, stealth burial mission, you remember, she says, Bad idea, sis. You're going to catch the guillotine for that decision. Let the dead bury their dead. Antigone replies, Be whoever seems best to you, but I, for my part, will bury that corpse. It is beautiful to me to do this and die. I will lie dearly with the corpse, with the dear corpse, Philometa. So it seems like, simply, Antigone is eager to be with her brother in the world below, in Hades in the afterlife. So she is happy, indeed finds it beautiful, Calon, to die up above so that she can live with her brother down below. Well, actually, that's not entirely correct. We haven't had any mention up to this point about life in Hades or the afterlife. Actually, and very strangely, in the play as a whole, we never have any mention of life in Hades or souls living in Hades or what it is like to live in Hades or really anything that specific about the life after death. In this, the Antigone is unique. Other plays like, by Sophocles, like the Electra, have the chorus talking about souls living on in Hades, or plays by Aeschylus, such as the Persians, have ghosts coming back for a chat. So Antigone doesn't talk about living with her brother in a kind of heaven. She just wants to lie kesomai with him. In Greek, this lying kemai, kesomai, is to lie dead. Here then it seems that Antigone just wants to lie dead with her dead brother in his deadness. Indeed, she hasn't mentioned anything but his corpse, and the pronouns she uses to reference him, autu, reference the nearest noun in Concord, which is his corpse, necros, and not his name. So Antigone is eager to be with her brother, but only with his dead corpse. It gets weirder. She sees the body of her brother, I suggest but not her brother's body fully. What do I mean by her brother's body fully? Antigone never mentions the history of Polynices or her brother Eteocles. She actually doesn't even mention any political strife or that they killed one another. She doesn't say anything about their dear heads or hands, the locks of their hair, but neither does she mention that one brother sieged the city, another defended, both killed each other. Ismene, her sister, notices this. Ismene reminds her primarily of body parts, of hands and eyes that acted treasonously or well, that committed suicide in the case of their parents, or fratricide in the case of their brothers. Woe, she says, oi moi, think, sister, 
of how our father perished, hated and ill-famed through the crimes he had himself detected after striking both his eyes himself with his own hand. And then his mother and his wife, two names in one, did violence to her life with twisted noose. And thirdly, our two brothers, on one day killing each other, did themselves both to death at one another's hands. The hands of the ones that is many loved were in motion. They have a past relevant for the present moment. <clears throat> as Mini's injunction to Antigone, Fronesson, take heed, think, is to remind her to take stock of the present moment and its significance for them both. It is also, we think, to direct her gaze to the hands of Polynices, slaughtering hands, but also the hands, eyes of their incestuous lineage. As Mini's brother is still dear to her, but she sees the traces of strife of, let's say, social injustice on his body. If we were to do some Cratylus-style name analysis, we could say Ismini's way of seeing Polynices is actually right there in his name in Greek. One way of translating Polynices, polunekes, is much strifed, polos neikos, involved in many strifes. This is Virilio's social body, a person who, in and through his material presence, is responsible to others involved in the life of community and city. Antigone, we could say, by her understanding, translates the name differently. She sees Polynices as rich corpse, pol as rich corpse, polunekos, polunekos. This is the animal body, the dust, the material part we share with the world. So for Antigone, Polynices is her corpsely brother, a historical, non-political, an animal body, Polo Nekos. Ismini suggests otherwise. The hands did kill. He was Polo Nekos. To bring in Virilio, Ismini, we could say, is the oblique function for Antigone. She brings to light by her resistance some crucial aspect of Polynices, of his body, that he was a responsible moral agent, that his hands accomplished certain things. Creon, the new ruler of Thebes, the uncle of Antigone and his meaning, the tyrant, also has thoughts on Polynices. For him, Polynices is no more than a social body, no more than a traitor, someone who acted in relation to the city and the city alone. Birds. Birds have been polluting the altars and in the city of Thebes. Each and every altar, every one, has received a piece of the dead Polynices of his corpse torn off by the birds and distributed to each altar in the city, as Tiresias the seer reports. This is punishment for Creon's refusal to bury him. Creon could not see Polynices in one place, so his body has been super abundantly distributed to each of the altars in the city. For all our altars and hearths, Tiresias says, are full of the feeding by both birds and dogs on the wretchedly fallen spawn of Oedipus. And therefore the gods no longer accept sacrificial prayers from us nor the flame from thigh bones, nor do the birds shout out the favorable sounds, since they have fed full on the fat, fed full on the fat of the blood of a slain man. So birds and dogs, as we've seen in Abe's talk, pop up whenever dead bodies pop up. This is standard. When Achilles and Hector are speaking, right before Hector dies, Achilles says, I hope the dogs eat your corpse, your soma, raw. Birds and dogs in Greek literature are the reminders of the elemental character of our persons, of our kinship to, to borrow a phrase, the dust of the earth. Mm -hmm. The birds and dogs and other beasts are retrievers, though, in this play. They take part of the corpse or corpses and distribute it to others. Burial is the process that hallows the dead by allowing them to enter the earth. So birds and dogs, we could say, are an anti-burial force. George Steiner notes that burial has a double motion of fusion and recoil with regards to the earth. The dead person's burial prevents their casual dissolution into their element earthly parts, the recoil, while also ensuring the absorption of their body into the earth, the fusion. The exposed corpse, then, represents an epiphany of the process that burial conceals, and by that epiphany also prevents the process from being hallowed. The exposure of the corpse, then, we could say, prevents its assimilation into the realm of spirit and instead reveals its base animality. The birds and dogs are, for Creon, his oblique function. 
they produce the resistance needed to reveal the body, in his case, the animal body. The body is not merely something in social environments responsible to others, but concrete, physical, smelling, decomposing. Creon does not see Polynices in his animal body specificity. He never mentions Polynices' hands. Twice he mentions his corpse, once to say that it should be eaten by dogs, and another time to say that he doesn't care about the pollution the corpse will bring. Polynices has disappeared for Creon in his animal part. He is only all social, all traitor. To wrap up then, the Antigone shows how a person in their structure can fracture in the sight of others. Antigone and Creon both only see a piece of Polynices. They cannot see the whole person integrated in all his aspects. This is the business of tragedy, though, to break and not pick up the pieces. No character in the Antigone really listens. The play, as Abigail Acavia has shown, lacks particles of listening. Cues in the Greek, one syllable long, that someone is responding to another with their speech. Ge and toy, if you're interested. We have then persons shut down to each other, misinterpreting one another, yet through these arrows, also oblique to each other, pointing up something that has been lost. As readers of tragedy, it is our job by these indirections to find directions out to locate the fractured person. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists for your wonderful talks, but also for everybody keeping time, which leaves us with plenty of time for questions. So I would like to open up the floor. Please, sir. First part I'll answer, does he offer the same thing? No. What do we each offer? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I think I, 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 I get what the question is uh, getting at. Um, the, I would say the, the problem connected to Pericles related to persons in Thucydides is the problem of his being the first man in Athens but not its actual ruler. Um, so that would be another way of getting at the final part that I dealt with, with the, the idiot and the king. Um, so however you would resolve that, I think, I think that would be in the direction of, of answering that question. That's my non-answer. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, there's a moment in the chorus um, where the chorus refers to uh, Antigone as Teros, right? Teros, which is, um, yeah, Teros. Uh, <laughs> you know, it can, <laughs> it can be a monster. Um, it can be a good thing. You know, a, a, a Scylla is a Teros, I think, if I remember right. Um, so the, the chorus is trustworthy insofar as they can give us something, I think, as grand as the Odon Man, right? So I, I kind of naively assume that whatever the chorus says is true. So it, I think the answer is that whatever Antigone is doing, even if it's right, is filtered through the fact that she is a terra. She is a, something wondrous, something kind of outside of what we even think of um, when we think of you know, a normal person wanting to see their brother buried. How's that? Yeah.
for one thing, I, I thought of this from the moment that I, I saw your abstract. The Antigone seems to me to be a kind of commentary on Homer, but in a really interesting way, as if it were channeled through Herodotus. <laughs> I mean, it really seems like the fusion of the first two talks. There's, all, there's almost no, I think, attention to the notion of the private human being in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Or maybe you could say that both of them are in a really subtle way con concerned, but only in a subtle way. And then you have in the Antigone, as if the fusion of these two questions, body and soul on the one hand, private person, citizen, use the mic since it's right here. Um, I have a question about Homer and Herodotus and burial mounds and monuments. So <clears throat> in the passage from the Odyssey that you quoted, it seems like Elpenor is saying, in order for my body soul to be reunited, I need a burial mound, right? And um, there's much talk in the Iliad about the need for burial mounds. Um, so I, I guess I'm just wondering, what, what would you say the burial mound is? vis-a-vis -vis the person. Now, the Herodotus component here would be, I seem to remember that the Persians are uh, fond of building monuments uh, to their deeds, particularly Darius and Xerxes, I think. Um, not, not burial mounds and not statues of themselves, but monuments. And so, um, given what you've said about the sort of uh, dynamics of personhood character in Herodotus, what would you say the monument is? So monuments and burial mounds. Yeah, that's a great question. Monuments, burial, mounds, uh, inscriptions, all sorts of things. Uh, there are elements of those in each of the ethnoi that Herodotus deals with, and you could talk endlessly on this. I think the Egyptians are the most, are the go-to pyramids, right? Like mummies, it's the thing everybody knows. Um, the Scythians also use elaborate burial mounds, which I sort of alluded to, um, with... Uh, the, the, and, and the most prominent contemporary historical example would be um, everybody, uh, all, at least all the Greeks at Marathon, getting buried buried on the spot in a burial ground, a burial mound. Um, so certainly that all that just underlines the importance of it. Uh, the particular question about the Persians using inscriptions, uh, uh, these all these wonderful things that they did, all the times they crossed the the river and all the times they conquered, um, you know. It, it, fits in with the broad way in which the Near Eastern empires are, are doing those things. Um, they, the Persians in Herodotus, the one thing they hate the most is lying, um, but it's the thing they do all the time, so, right? Uh, and so what does Darius uh, love to do? Put lies up on rocks so that they're not lies anymore. I, I think that would be uh, at least the brief answer to that. I'd, I'd like to say two things about the burial mounds in Homer. The Elpenor story is really good uh, for focusing our attention on one aspect of the burial mound. Mostly they're spoken of as coastal devices. In other words, they exist so that people sailing by on ships can see them. And that reveals something about their function vis-a-vis -vis the body. On the one hand, it needs to hide the body, but on the other hand, it needs to present a kind of visible marker. There's a question over here. Yeah. Um, so, Professor Schoener, how would you kind of uh, suggest that the idea or the, the incorruptibility of Hector's body at the end of um, at the end of the Iliad when Achilles tries to desecrate it, how does that play into your idea of I really don't know, but it's a really good question, and it's one that I've pondered. So I don't know, not because I haven't thought about it, but because I have thought about it and I can't get to the bottom of it. But let me ask all of you a question in return. It's something that I wondered about in order to answer this question. What's, what's the fate of Hector's soul? I don't even remember if he appears in the Odyssey. Does he? Like, is there any... Is there any phrase, psyche hectoros? See what I'm saying? There's something really weird that happens.
precisely because of the strange thing that happens to his body. He might lose his soul as far as the ethics go. As if the incorruptibility of the body somehow prevents the appearance of the soul. Well, it, but it's also a question about Marathon, is it not? Would you address Marathon? Yeah, well, uh, I was going to say something about a different passage maybe, but... Um, yeah, the, the one example I would use is, so Xerxes is crossing with five million men uh, over the Hellespont. Uh, he gets up on the cliffside and he's crying about how in a hundred years they'll all be dead, and uh, he tamps down his nihilism with uh, just ignoring it. Um, and um, one of the problems as Herodotus is uh, giving us the review of the army is that you can't count them because the Persians count in blobs of people. Uh, we don't, there's five million men, so to speak. Uh, if you translate it into Greek thinking about counting, uh, we can count the men. Uh, this is what's lost when people get upset about precisely numbering how many soldiers really and how many other people really were involved in Xerxes' expedition. Uh, it's the point of the passage. It's not a problem in Herodotus' thinking. Um, so that uh, with an empire like Xerxes, is, it's, it's precisely the case that the army can't be numbered at the individual level. You have a, uh, they put a whole group of folks uh, into an area, they mark it off, and then the next group comes in that area, and they say, okay, there we go, another Another, the, the same number, whatever that is, uh, uh, has, is now uh, counted. But that's, of course, not how you count people. It's a convenient way of doing it, but it reveals uh, a problem. Um, and then on the flip side at Marathon, um, yeah, certainly everyone getting buried together in a single mound at the battle site as opposed to, like in uh, Thucydides, uh, being put maybe by tribes, uh, maybe by tribes and families into the public monuments. Uh, that certainly is a different way of reckoning it um, and an emphasis on the singleness of the body of the Greeks at Marathon. about the territorial vine. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this is the hard one, which is why I left it out. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting idea. So really, I was really interested in um, speed and in our relationship to the, to the world as a result of speed. And he talks about how um, you, you can't have a body without a world. So when, when, we, when we walk around, um, we're aware of our bodies, we're in space. When you're in an automobile, um, he says your body is dead. You're not aware of your body in any meaningful way. So the territorial body is the third body because it's kind of a, it's a necessary consequence of us being incarnate that we have a world to traverse. When that world is contracted by greater and greater speed, you can't really go anywhere anymore when you can get on the Concorde and you're in Paris. Do you know what the Concorde is? Sorry, do you know what the Concorde Okay. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't know about the Concorde. I'm too young for the Concorde, but, um, but I do. Uh, does that help at all? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. And there's some interesting bits in... Um, Oh, who was this in? Was it in Plutarch? I can't remember, but about the impiety of mining for, for metals. Uh, because the idea is you shouldn't be d really disturbing the earth because you don't know what's in the earth. Which I think connects with that. Yeah. Yeah.
Well, thank you again. Wait, wait, I have one more question. <laughs> and this is great. So, in, elsewhere in Homer, what happens to the shades when their bodies are treated properly? Do they, because when you describe the interaction with Odysseus, they seem agitated, like, like they won't talk. Is it because they're, I mean, is there something, what happened, I mean, the, uh, the, you talk about the shade as an image or a projection of it. I was, in my own mind, describing more of a, like, identity to the shade rather than, than, than something less real. What does Homer say happens when the bodies of the dead are treated the right way? Or where, where do we see them in a different state when that's been the case for their particular lives? So I, I think that everybody that he sees, that Odysseus sees in Hades in the Odyssey, for all of them, their body has been treated properly except for Elphinor. So I glossed over something really important in my talk because I didn't know what to make. Elfenor talks to Odysseus about drinking the blood. Nobody else does. What does that mean? Because he's the one who's complaining about not being buried. There being no further questions, we'll thank our panelists one last time.